Thank you for having me here. Um, I feel like Abdurrahman is kind of robbed in an intro, so I'm going to give one. Um, I'll let you do the Googling if you want a professional intro, but I think it would be unfair to not say thank you and the appreciation where it is deserved. Um, and beside Abdurrahman, I'm also looking at Khali Amina and at Zain and Amr Firas. Abdurrahman, as maybe many of you know, is my husband. I moved out here to the Bay Area not too long ago to start residency at UCSF. Um, but we did the long distance marriage for over three years before I came here. Um, the Jandari family, who is very well known to the Bay Area, has been nothing but incredibly gracious and welcoming and supportive and has kind of made me a part of their community here, where I can now call this my community as well. There will always be a favorite in my heart, though, North Carolina. Um, but you can show me, you know, in a few years to come, inshallah. Um, so throughout all of this, um, this tragedy that no one can ever prepare for. How people respond and your loved ones respond is not something that you can tell them what to do or how to do it. And everyone has kind of commented as I have fallen apart over and over again that, mashallah, your husband, Abdurrahman, who's been at your side, has been incredibly amazing. And I just, I wanted to say thank you. And um, and the night that I found out, as you all heard Abdurrahman say he was in New York, um, I was at San Francisco General Hospital writing a prescription for an antibiotic for a patient um, when I started receiving text messages. I can get to that story in a second, but Fast forward a little bit, and it was Khaled Amina, my mother-in-law, who dropped everything, um, packed her belongings, and drove from the East Bay, picked me up, and took me to the airport, and flew with me to North Carolina, and stayed with my family for weeks as she took care of us. So I would like a round of applause for this. And for Amal Firas, who basically let her come to me, and for Zayn for being okay without his mommy for a while. <laughs> okay, on a slightly different note. February 10th, a day that I wish I can erase from all of our memories. I was in scrubs on a pediatric rotation, writing a prescription, when I started getting these text messages of condolences. I got the first one pretty non-specific. I was like, oh, it's either a mistake, she sent it to the wrong person, or it's about someone in Syria because we're, you know, we have a lot of families still in, in the conflict, afflicted areas. And then more started coming in, and I told my attending, I, I was starting to shake, and I said, I, I need to make a couple phone calls. I don't know what's going on. And as I'm on the phone with my father, asking him in a very calm way, and he's very calm, about what is happening, um, I'm getting Facebook messages from Turkey and Syria and Abu Dhabi saying, is it true what we heard about Ziyad? And I'm frantically looking through Facebook, looking online, and I can't find anything. What are people talking about? And I call my father, and he... He says there's been a shooting in the neighborhood um, in Dia's apartment complex. We don't know anything else yet. Um, the whole area is on lockdown. I wasn't worried. My brother would have no reason to be hanging outside. Um, he's probably in his apartment. The whole complex is on lockdown. Who cares? Like gang violence, drugs, alcohol, party went wrong, something. But I was still a little shaken up. Something's going on. And I stayed, you know, calling my dad every now and then, but people are talking to me about Ziyat, what do they mean? Um, I go back to the residency room where I was writing that prescription and I go to Google and I just Google Chapel Hill shooting. 
And I find an article that says, um, I haven't been able to really talk about this much, so forgive me if I lose my words at times. Um, I find an article that says that in that apartment complex, uh, in one unit, there were three people that were pronounced dead at the scene after being shot in the head. Who are those two other people? And who are they talking about? This whole agony of like finding out lasted a good five hours. It wasn't until about midnight. It wasn't until I had, Abdelhamid had booked a red eye for me from New York that I had finally somehow made it to the airport just an hour later, getting ready to check in that I got the confirmatory call. First it was, it's their apartment complex. Of course, I tried calling him, my brother. He's not picking up. Let me see if Yusuf like, can tell me what's going on with my brother. She's not picking up. Not only are they not picking up, their phones are off. And we all, I'm freaking out. And every time I hear more information, I think I have cleaned up the hospital floors by that time. Make it to the, to the airport, and I get the confirmatory call from my brother, Faris, saying, it's them. They've confirmed their identities. Liat, Yusuf, and Razan are dead. Why? What happened? What's going on? Like, what, what, what happened? Why? What's going on? It can't be true. It can't be true. It can't be true. That's what I kept saying for like the next two weeks. It can't be true. It can't be true. Surely it can't be true. I'll see them. I'm going to go home. I'm going to... I, I hope never any of you have to sit on a plane without any internet connection for I don't know how many hours to make it home to learn anything else. up in North Carolina. Can you, I show up in North Carolina and I greet my parents at home and I freak out. I start wailing and I faint again. And I start running up to Diaz's room because I need to find him. I can't find him. And my parents freak out even more so I start calming down. And that was about as much freak out as I was allowed for the next couple of weeks. When I got off the plane in New York to connect, to go to Raleigh, and where Abdurrahman joined us in New York, it was not even Fajr time. And I started frantically messaging people who I knew in media, people I knew in journalism. The plane ride, I was still very numb. I just stared out the, w the window. I had no emotion. Every now and then, I would like react somehow, but it didn't really manifest in any way other than I was in work mode. What do I do next? What do I do next? Um, I wailed for a little bit at home, and the house was already filled with people. I didn't talk to a single soul. I went upstairs with Abdurrahman, and we started working, working on a press statement, and working to figure out how this press statement was even going to reach people. We had no idea the uh, impact it would have, or the effect it would have and how big of a story it would and should have become. I'm still trying to process that I'm in my brother's room and I'm never going to see him again. And that only 10 days prior, I was in the same bedroom where he had given me a hug, sat me in his lap, rocked me back and forth in his big body in my little petite frame where he rocked me and kissed me on the forehead and told me he loved me and was telling me about all the amazing accomplishments he was doing and how he was at the top 10% of his class and how he was going to do residency and how he's so happy with you said and how him and you said are going to start their own practice and how he's planning all these amazing things for his upcoming trip in Turkey and I'm never going to hear from him again. The line of work that I do, um, I'm a resident at UCSF, uh, a family medicine resident. So 
who work actually exclusively at San Francisco General Hospital, which is a safety net hospital. For those of you who don't know, it's um, they turn away patients with insurance. So it's for the you know explicitly for the underserved, vulnerable patient populations, predominantly homeless. Um, drug issues, you name it, psychosocial issues that you wouldn't even imagine. These are the patients I work with and I've dedicated my life to. I grew up, you know, born and raised in North Carolina, not the most enlightened state in the country, but still, I mean, Southern hospitality is very much a true thing. And what I grew up, you know, trying to embody is this whole almost defensive, Muslim attitude, where I was in ninth grade when 9-11 happened, and I wore a hijab, I was proud of it. I had friends who were shoved into lockers. I had grown-ups driving by in cars as I'm waiting for my mom to pick me up, flick me off with their middle finger and tell me to go back to my mother after the home country. I've experienced bigotry myself. I was interviewing for family medicine programs two years ago now. And I was interviewing at the top family medicine program in the country, by rankings that don't really matter so much, but the fact that it gets a top ranking is important in this context. It's a day-long interview. It starts by the program director presenting information about the program um, followed by tours of the hospital and the clinic, followed by several interviews that last a long time, and et cetera, et cetera. The very opening hour where the program director is introducing the program, they, he's going through a slideshow, and there's a picture of some of the family medicine residents dressed in traditional Muslim garb. One is wearing an Afghan blue burqa, Two are wearing jibbabs and hijabs that are very poorly placed, and the male within them was wearing a turban. Now the applicant in me knew that I was endangering my risks by asking any more about this. But the rebel in me and the part that always wants to stand up for justice is like, I don't care. I went up after this hour lecture of introducing the program and asked him, can I ask you a question? Do you mind pulling up? He was like, I might know what you're talking about. What is it you're referencing? And I, I say, you know, the picture with like people dressed as Muslims. So oh, I was worried you would you would um, take offense to that. I meant to take it out. Our C president this year mentioned it last year, and I just forgot to take it out. So what's going on exactly? And he goes on to tell me that um, it was part of cultural awareness where, by the way, a quarter of their patient population are Somali refugees. So this is very important. A quarter of their patients are Muslim. He said, we had residents split up, and these residents acted like they couldn't speak English so that the other group can understand what it feels like to talk to people who don't speak English. Really, someone in an Afghan burqa in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> I went on the tour, I came back, I didn't even stay for lunch. I skipped the interviews, I talked to the program director and I handed him my badge and I said, unfortunately, you are an unfit place for me to work. <laughs> he later wrote and apologized, and I'm pretty sure that letter will never be there. And I did my due diligence as an American citizen and reported them to care, it's still a case. It's being I go on to say that I am not new to bigotry. I am not new to what Islamophobia means to me. I have been in North Carolina and in San Francisco where I have had patients who refuse to shake my hand and to see me because of this fabric that I wear on my head. I have been in operating rooms where attendings try to challenge me and debate me about Islam as I am holding a scalpel on a patient. It's not okay. And it's time we give a damn and we do something about it. I 
I never realized that on February 10th, Islamophobia would literally come knocking on our doorsteps. Bang, 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 your loved ones are gone. Your exemplary American Muslim citizens have been killed. Why? Over a parking dispute. What parking dispute? There was no one parked in his car spot. There wasn't even anyone parked in the adjacent visitor's parking spot that he claimed was his. Get your narrative straight. They were killed because they were Muslim. They were killed because this man was crazy and ignorant and scared because of what he's heard about Muslims. Don't get me wrong, he's very much guilty of his act. But this atmosphere around us is terrifying. It has killed three of the purest, most beautiful, most peace-loving, most contributing members of our society. Most contributing members in the world. The things that they have accomplished, I mean, he's my little brother. I raised him. I helped him figure out what classes to take in high school and college and how to strategize taking the DAT and applying to dental school. And when that last conversation I had with him 10 days before he was murdered, my jaw dropped because he was showing me his CV and he was telling me all these amazing things that he was doing and I was so proud of him and I was never so much more prouder of him to see what he has become and what he's going to contribute. Yusuf had just gotten accepted into dental school at UNC, one of the top dental schools where they, husband and wife, can study together. They just started their life six weeks prior. I was at their wedding. Six weeks prior, we were at their wedding. The last time Abdurrahman saw either of them was at their wedding. Tell me that isn't heart-wrenching. I'm confused. I'm confused because my entire life, my mission, my jihad has been to become and be an exemplary American Muslim professional woman who kills and challenges stereotypes right and left. And I have done that. And I'm proud to say that I have done that, but it's not enough. It's not enough because even though I am still standing here today and I can talk to you today, my brother, his bride, and her sister will never be able to share that story. I tell Abdul Rahman they'll never know the loving uncle and aunt that they would be one day if we had children. I will never get to meet their children. Our family all of a sudden shrunk. The Abu Salah has, may Allah make it easy on them, they lost their two daughters 30 seconds apart. They're survived by their oldest brother. What does an older brother do other than protect his little sisters? When they found out that something had happened at Diyat's apartment, they thought it was just Diyat. And they were coming to see how they can be supportive of my parents. Yusuf was studying medicine in the Caribbean at the time. He wasn't even here. When they found out that three people were involved, they figured it was Dliya, Yusuf, and one of Dliya's friends. They show up, and it's Dliya, Yusuf, and Razan. Razan, whose only crime was that she was going to visit her sister who was feeling a little lonely, and was going to have dinner with them. They were having dinner at the time. When a mad person comes in, to your own home. What freedoms do we have? If even in our own homes we aren't safe. When an exemplary American citizen who has done nothing but contribute wonderful things to his society, Muslim and non-Muslim, can have anyone walk into his home, kill his wife and his sister-in-law in front of his own eyes, and finish him off, off with a bullet in the mouth.
I apologize if this is too heavy. But it's not just a media article. It's not just a YouTube click that you can a YouTube click clip that you can avoid. It's happened to our own homes. And what makes this so relatable, and I think the reason why it has shocked the number of people that it has, is because it could have been you. Diyat, Yusin, and Ruzan were like any of your children or siblings. You know, for the longest time, we, we thought of Islamophobia as this foreign thing, that um, it affects foreign policy, it's politically advantageous, it's socially acceptable within Hollywood, within Washington, to hate on Muslims, and therefore it would further their political agendas overseas, and they can do this whole war on terror and continue killing all these Al-Qaeda and ISIS people. Us Muslims just feel like we have to keep on doing good, do the, do the good Muslim and just smile all the time and be kind. And we should be doing all those things. We figured that would be enough. But what was it about Bia, Yusuf, and Razan? Is that the reality of the extent of Islamophobia has now reached a level that we cannot ignore because it has hit home. It has killed Americans. It has killed Americans who were born and raised in freaking North Carolina. People don't see that. People still ask me where I'm from. Raleigh, North Carolina, if you want to be more specific, I was born in Salisbury, North Carolina, which you've never heard of, because it's a small little white town. Oh, really? So what do we do? A lot of people have asked me that question, what do we do? The reason we're here tonight and we support this cause very much so before it even affected our families the way it has is to donate generously because it is only through these efforts where we have actual data, actual research, actual facts that we can go and use as rebuttals for some of these things. There are machines in the multi, multi-million dollars that are attacking Islam. We don't need that much because we only want to shed light on the truth and the truth doesn't cost much, but it costs money to get some information out there. We just want the facts out there. Number two, because I'm a part of the American Muslim community, I think it might give me a little bit of license to be self-critical, so allow me. Um, I'm sick of the empty talks and the khutbas that do not mean anything, um, and words that come through here and leave through here. What are we going to do when we leave here today? How are we going to make a difference? Right now, all we're saying is, okay, Dr. Hatton, here you go. You take care of this problem. <laughs> While that's important, and we support everyone who's working on this, there is a responsibility on every single one of us. Every one of you is a leader. Who here is a parent? Not a lot of parents. Who here is a parent? Okay. Parents are leaders. Who here is a sibling? That should make almost everyone, unless you're an only child. That also makes you a leader. Who here is an employee? You're a leader, and for many, the only Muslim people will ever encounter. Now, it's a known fact that the general American public, when exposed to a personal interaction with a Muslim, is less likely to be prejudiced and racist and bigoted against a Muslim than someone who has never interacted with a Muslim. So this place is actually a tremendous amount of responsibility and amana and everything on our shoulders. So what I was saying earlier about being that good Muslim, you know, remember that people are watching you, that still stands. That still very much stands. But we can do more than that. 
Being a Muslim is about your actions and not the words. What do you do to your neighbors? We tend to click and just stick to our own little Muslim bubbles. But what do we do outside of that? Where do our children go? They play soccer. Do they volunteer with their Muslim friends and go donate food to the homeless? Parents, do you model those things for your children? Because that's not how they learn. You don't just ship them off to an Islamic school and accept them, expect them to learn these things. They emulate your actions. So parents, when was the last time you were involved in volunteerism, in activism, in seeing something that was totally preposterous?